What's up? I'm Troubleshoot. In this quick power user guide, I'll be showing you the most important command that you could possibly know as a Docker user. If you're a developer, this is especially going to be important to you as customizing and building Docker files into containers is going to leave a ton of stuff left over in previous versions and iterations. And you can very quickly fill up your hard drive or a virtual server with a ton of useless stuff that you really don't actually need. For example, I've used Docker Compose a few times building my own Rust containers and stuff like that. And after 10 or so iterations, it can eat up an entire drive and fill up a VPS super quick. And you won't even know where all of your space went, which is bad. For example, I don't use Windows all that often for Docker container hosting. And even though currently I don't have any containers here, there's nothing. I've removed them all from my Docker desktop app. The largest file on my hard drive is still the Docker folder at 70 gigs with everything inside of it. What's all the space? Well, if you've ever built or customized containers, it's probably a whole bunch of cash. And even if you haven't done that, these commands are still going to save you a ton of space. But before we get into saving you tons of space with these useful commands, this video was sponsored by Brilliant. It's a fantastic place to learn new skills through thousands of interactive lessons. You'll hear more on them later. There's a couple of things that you obviously need to know the difference between. If you already know the difference between containers, images, networks, and volumes, well, you can skip ahead a few seconds. Otherwise, stick around for a moment. Whenever you get a program to run under Docker, it's usually a single program per container. That's a container. It's the thing that hosts all the different files that's required for the program to run and access the internet, etc. These containers are built off of images. Images are, for example, Debian, Ubuntu, or just a pre-configured image that you can download off of the internet that comes with, say, Ubuntu and Nginx for web hosting, for example. That is an image. You download a pre-made thing off of the internet, and that gets built and customized and files added to it into a container. That container is run with your program inside of it. Anything you change in this runtime environment is saved inside of a volume, whether it's a volume that just is nameless and just exists on your drive with a bunch of different files in it, such as configuration, cache, etc. as your programs run, or you manually define a specific volume, which is common enough to do, then space could start adding up pretty quickly, especially when you get to deleting older projects, especially if you don't remove and delete these dangling volumes. And finally, obviously, networks. If you have a bunch of different containers that need to speak to each other, you'll put them into a network. That network allows them all to chat with each other through different ports without your system's firewall interfering with them for the most part. And of course, they won't be able to speak to the internet unless you specifically allow them. So they won't accept requests and stuff like that unless you specifically open ports into this network, allowing them into your containers. All of this is usually handled under the hood. And if you just type Docker run Nginx or something, it's going to set up images, containers, networks, and everything like that in the background for you. That's kind of where it gets a little bit confusing, especially if you're new to Docker and you've only just started using Docker Compose files to manage a bunch of different containers. It's going to be super difficult to know exactly where all of your space is going. That's where this Docker prune command comes in. There's a bunch of them as it's pretty granular and there's one super user Docker prune that does everything in one go and a little bit extra. So in order to use Docker prune and save yourself a ton of space, open up your command line interface, whether on Windows it's the WSL or it's SSHing into your virtual private server or anything like that. And inside of here, we're going to be running a few commands. So everything that we're going to be running in this video revolves around one particular command or subset of commands. That is Docker followed by something and prune. Prune essentially means to get rid of things you're not currently using. If we use Docker image prune, for example, it'll get rid of all of the images that aren't currently used in containers that are running. If we use Docker container prune, it'll get rid of all of our stopped containers and things that we're not actually using, which obviously could be a little bit dangerous if you're running this in a production environment, which is why you want to be careful before you just outright run these things. There's also volume prune to get rid of older volumes that aren't being used by anything. And finally, network prune, which is going to be a little bit of cleanup, I suppose. It's not going to be such a huge space saver. Let's go ahead and test out some of these commands. So first of all, let's see what kind of old images we can get rid of for previous versions of programs and things like that that we've downloaded. We can use docker image prune in order to get rid of all dangling images that aren't currently tagged and things like that. Usually this will be relatively small. And if I run it on my production server here, docker image prune, we 
don't really see too much here either. But if we use docker image prune space hyphen a is all images with at at least one container associated. If we choose yes here, this is going to take a lot longer. As you can see, I've now saved myself 3.6 gigs worth of disk space. And if we run the same command on my system, even though there's nothing set up here, we might save a bit of space here as well. And yeah, because I've built a bunch of different Rust containers and stuff like that in the background, we've now saved seven and a half gigs, which is pretty big. We can also quickly clean up all of our containers that we're not currently using. For example, Docker container prune, which will remove all stopped containers. So this is a little bit more dangerous than the other commands. Make sure you run Docker PS to find out what containers you currently have running on your system and Docker PS space hyphen A to see all of the containers stopped or not on your system. Running this on my production server, we should see a lot more, for example. Obviously, if I were to run the command here, everything that's currently stopped should be cleaned out and we can save ourselves quite a bit of space. Obviously, if I run it on my PC that's not currently running anything, we're not going to save too much and we obviously didn't save much at all. But if we run this on a more used environment, we should expect more, but sometimes there's just nothing, especially if you're pretty good at removing containers you're not currently using. This is more for people who just run something, test it, stop it, and forget about it. You could save quite a bit of space if that sounds like you. Then we can move to cleaning up extra networks that aren't currently attached to our containers and environments which doesn't really save you file space, but it could make your system a little bit snappier. If we use docker network prune, it'll get rid of all custom networks not used by at least one container, and it's not even going to tell us a file size, as it's more of a background thing just to clean up the general environment. And once again, on a production server, it shouldn't result in too much at all, at least if you're relatively clean with things. And now that we've run container image and network, there's one final one to use, which is docker volume prune, which should get rid of all anonymous local volumes not used by at least one container. So when you create a container like Nginx and you tell it specifically to use a volume called config, it's not going to delete that. Even if you turn off and delete your Docker container for Nginx, it should still retain that name. But if you create an Nginx server or something and you don't actually name those volumes, but they're still created in the background, that's what this will get rid of. So just make sure you have all of your containers running or whatever that you want to keep. And when you run this command, you may save a little bit of space, but usually, once again, it's not going to be too much unless you're super busy on your server. Once again, you're not going to see too much here either. There's one that we haven't mentioned, and that's the builder cache. This is all of the stuff that's downloaded and used to build containers, which is especially important if you build your own containers using Docker files or you customize existing Docker files and build your own from them. If we use Docker, Builder prune, you should see there's a lot more here as we're clearing all dangling build cache that isn't currently being used. If we say yes, this is going to be quite big, especially if you're someone who goes through iteration after iteration, building different Docker files or making your own things. Here it reached 1.9 gigabytes, which is pretty big, but we can also add a hyphen A to the end of it to remove all the build cache, not just the dangling build cache. So if we use this command now, it's going to remove even more and we should save a bit more space. Here I haven't saved too much, but again on a production server, if we use docker builder prune hyphen a, it should save us even more. And yeah, there you go. We saved a solid gigabyte. Obviously for your system, it may be bigger, smaller, etc. If you came across this command as you're running out of disk space, well, this one's going to save you quite a bit. And finally, the command to end all commands, docker system prune. This does everything in one go. It's super powerful. So be careful. If we agree to this, it should save us some space. But obviously, as we've run all of these different commands one by one, it's not going to really do all that much. So there you go. Well, nothing was saved as we did everything manually bit by bit, but this command does all of the previous steps in one go. So just make sure you understand everything that we've done up until now, and then you should be comfortable using this command. Usually it's good to run, especially if you have your environment set up, you have everything you need running, and there's not much else that you're going to add to it or develop for quite a while that isn't already running. You can run this command and bam, save a huge amount of space. There are a couple of options that I didn't mention here, and one of them is the filter option, which allows us to customize exactly what we're removing. For example, you could filter to key value pairs, but most of the time you'll be filtering using until. This essentially allows you to control exactly what images, networks, containers, build cache, etc. is removed by giving it a timestamp or a relative time. So everything before maybe 24 hours ago should be cleared by simply using 
for example, docker container prune filter, followed by until equals, and then a timestamp, a date, or something like 24 hours. This means that everything from before 24 hours ago that falls under this usual removal category will be removed and nothing more recent will get removed. This is more useful, especially if you're currently building in your environment and stuff like this, and you only want to get rid of stuff that you're not currently using. You can obviously use a specific datum or even a timestamp, etc., but that's more advanced. Speaking of more advanced, if you're interested in learning more about computers and thinking in a more developer slash programmatic mindset, then this video's sponsor is for you. Brilliant. Brilliant makes learning fun. You'll learn tons of new skills through interaction, which has proven to be the best way to learn. Brilliant is a place where you learn by doing. Through thousands of interactive lessons on math, data analysis, programming, AI, and more, where each lesson is filled to the brim with hands-on problem solving that's proven to be six times more effective than just learning from lectures. The lessons in Brilliant are crafted by award-winning teachers, researchers, and professionals from places like Google, MIT, Caltech, Microsoft, and more. Building critical thinking skills makes you a better thinker, and of course, a better learner. You just learned some of the most important commands in your self-hosting career, as Docker does like eating up tons of your system if you happen to look away for too long. Take a bit of that time to look away to Brilliant, where from just 10 minutes a day, you can learn new skills really quick. If you're interested in expanding your coding abilities, then I think you'd be interested in Brilliant's creative coding course. You'll get familiar with Python and start building programs from day one using the built-in drag-and-drop editor. You'll learn essential coding elements from loops and variables to nesting and conditionals. Develop your mind to think like a programmer, building a strong foundation in writing robust programs. Brilliant's growing number of programming courses are a great way to build foundations and learn real-world applications. To try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash troubleshoot or click on the link in the description. You'll also get 20% off your annual subscription. And with that quick break in continuity, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. My name's been Troubleshoot, and I'll see you all next time. Ciao.